Hello, Guilty Feminists. It's Deborah Francis White. I am sending you a message at the top of the episode. We recorded this episode last year. And since then, I have been educated by disability spokespeople about use of the word crazy, for example, colloquially to mean something like erratic. Now, we recorded this episode before I'd talked to anyone about that. And in it, our brilliant guest, Susie Yusuf, who is incredibly funny and brilliant, was telling a story in which she referred to outcrazing the crazy. And what she meant was to use unpredictable behavior to put off someone who was being predatory. She did not mean this in any way, and the guilty feminist does not mean this in any way, to imply that people with mental health issues would be less vulnerable to somebody predatory on the street. Of course, that is not the case. It is obviously not the case, and it's not what she meant. It was not possible to edit this story out, so I wanted to say to you ahead of time, this is a colloquial use of the word in an amusing story. I needed to give you a heads up about it because I didn't want anyone to be surprised or thrown by it. We are trying to evolve and adapt as we go, but often we record episodes months in advance and then they come out and we've already had a note about something. So we just wanted to say on this occasion, we hope you enjoy the episode. All of our guests are brilliant on it. It's about safety. I'm a feminist, but I own 48 pairs of shoes. <laughs> I've realised that when I'm introduced to someone new, I look them briefly in the face and then check out their footwear. <laughs> it's true. And when we meet later, I'll be like, hello, oh, nine out of ten. Like, I totally, I'm too shoesy. I'm the same with handbags. Are you? I don't care about shoes very much. They're painful. Handbags are never painful. <laughs> I'm a feminist. But earlier today, I referred to a man who was complaining that it's not all men as a whiny little bitch. <laughs> but I had just read this thing that said bitch is used to refer to angry women and low status men. So it's a gendered insult because women shouldn't be angry and men shouldn't kind of cower. And I thought, God, that's so insightful. And I think that's why it was in my head. And why then I immediately referred to a man as a whiny... I've never said it in my life, but it just came out. Whiny little bitch. I'm a feminist, but when my eight-year-old son declared that his favourite colour was pink, I was really proud, but also secretly relieved when he couldn't get the bike he wanted for his birthday in that colour. And the reason was, I was like, you love pink. I'm super excited that you love pink, but I reckon the boys at school are going to give you shit. That's... It's, I mean, it's it true. It was a sad ending to that one, wasn't it? It's, tr was like, it's true, but in a way, unless boys get pink bikes, we'll never yeah. break that stereotype. I think you should buy him a pink bike. Oh. As a challenge. <laughs> and see how that goes down. I don't think you can't do podcast challenges on your children. That's not right. No, I don't think it's fair. <laughs> I know, I know how my heart ached for him the other day. He came home from school and he said that he'd played footy and one of the other boys had done something and he said, and he was being unfair and then I accidentally cried. Oh, no. And I was like, oh, oh I've just stabbed myself in the heart with the accidentally cried bit. <laughs> like, oh, 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 and then I was like, it's okay, it's good for you to cry because it gets all your emotion out of your eyes. Like, you get to, <laughs> you don't hold it inside, it comes out your eyes and your face and then you feel better. So you're allowed to cry, like setting him up for a adulthood of being... I'm so happy about that and it kind of makes up for the pink bike situation <laughs> where you let all of feminism down, pal. So that's... <laughs> Listen, that wasn't my judgement, that was the judgement of this audience who so far, who so far have been very abrasive and are pretty drunk. <laughs> um, I'm a feminist, but I once chased a man down the street screaming because he stole my makeup bag out of my handbag thinking it was my purse because I had a Laura Mercier lipstick in my favourite shade that was discontinued. And I was like, this is the last I'm ever seeing of it. I'm saving it. And I knew he's just going to throw it in the bin. It was an instinct. It's not the right thing to do. You're not meant to protect possessions like that. I'm a feminist, but when I was going backpacking with my husband, who was then my boyfriend, I made him go through a street riot with mounted police and riot shields so that we could go back to a department store where I'd seen a really nice green raincoat. <laughs> We're both alive, we've got a kid, like he's got a bike, it's not pink, but you know, it's all working out. I was like, they won't
don't mind us. We're not from here. And he was like, how will I know that? And I was like, well, we're the only ones going shopping. So. <laughs> I'm a feminist. I'm a feminist, but if I had a time machine that was set to only two moments in history, of which I could only choose one, one moment, the moment that women in Australia got the vote and celebrated in the street, or two, a seminal 18-year-old sexual awakening experience as outlined lovingly in Patrick Swayze's autobiography. <laughs> I'd say, well done, ladies, but I'll be there for the party when you get marriage equality. <laughs> Live from Giant to Wharf in Sydney! This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and the hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. Today, we are talking about safety and how safe we feel as feminists. We're talking about physical safety, and that's a real minefield topic, I think, because anything that seems like take care of your own safety seems like has an undertone of victim blaming. And so we were like, how do we deal with this? And how do I get to a place where I have permission to stand up and fight back but I don't feel like I have a responsibility to do that. And I don't feel bad about myself if I don't. I don't turn myself into a victim, but I can take power. I can feel how, I, I've been in Australia a week doing this podcast, and mm -hmm. I think I sound so Australian compared to, do I sound more Australian than normal? Do I sound so Australian? I've just, it comes and goes. I can feel it. It's what, what I love though is the way, the when Deborah does a really, like she does her authentic Oka accent, it just sounds fake. Like it's like, <laughs> You're an Australian person with an English accent doing an Australian accent. I know, like I know, I know, I know. I have no authentic accent. Because English people often go, are you Australian or do you look like this? There's something in your voice. So they think I sound a bit Australian. Australians think I sound like a pom. Mm -hmm. And when I do an Australian accent, they're all like, Pfft. you sound like a pom trying to do Kath and Kim badly. Yeah. <laughs> There's nowhere that this voice is home. It's hard for me. Um, we'll be taking over a collection for Deborah's accent. <laughs> Put it in the charity bin, digger! <laughs> Still call Australia home, Cal. I don't know what that noise was. That was like, oh, oh, oh. It was like a, Ooh, It was like, oh, are we talking like, about a Qantas ad? What's happening? Woo. Yeah. So we're talking about safety. We've done a little bit of a... I think what it's hard for men to understand is that we are always living with a sort of low-level alert it's vigilance. So, it's like just... Yes, hypervigilance. Hmm. I had an interesting conversation. I had a couple of interesting conversations uh, with my husband over 10 years. Um, <laughs> that sounds terrible. I've had many interesting conversations with him, but these two stuck out. Um, he's lovely and doesn't listen to this podcast. So... Well, then how lovely is he? <laughs> uh, so, uh, my husband is six foot four. He's a big, white, straight male. We were walking through town. You've said that like he's a breed of whale. <laughs> oh. He's a big, white, straight male. I got, it's like I'm, I got a Great Dane and a white, straight male. That's <laughs> <laughs> how you've described him. Yeah, yeah, the, yes. The, Go on, continue. What now did I'm he thinking say? of him chasing tennis balls. We're like, come on, Chris, off you go. <laughs> So we had this conversation, so Chris is a tall, um, he's fit, he's tall, he's six foot four. We were walking through Melbourne at midnight a couple of years ago and he suddenly turns to me and goes, I don't feel safe in town anymore. There's so much ice around, there's so many drugs around. I just, it's so unpredictable, I just don't feel safe. And I said to him, that's how I felt my whole life. And he went, oh, I get it. And I was like, you know, an ice epidemic is quite a high price to pay for just one realisation. Um, <laughs> from one middle class man yeah, to suddenly but, you know, it's a start. feel, it's feel a start. vulnerability. Yeah. yeah. But listen, if Crystal Meth has to reach every town in the world <laughs> to the proportion where men feel a bit unsafe, <laughs> it's a price worth paying, I think we can all agree. <laughs> So that when we drive, if he's driving, he makes sure the doors are unlocked because if we had an accident, you have to be able to get out. But if I'm driving, I lock the doors because if you stop at the traffic lights, someone might try and get in. Like we have a, a different version of what safety is. Yes. Um, 
we were having breakfast one morning and we got to talking about feeling safe and sexual assault and sexual harassment and stuff. And there was a massive mother's group at this cafe and I was like, we chose well. Uh, and I said to him, if I stood up now and went, who here has been sexually harassed or assaulted? Every single one of those women, I bet you would have a story to tell. I won't do that because I don't want to ruin everyone's breakfast. But he was so shocked at that idea. And I was like, no, there's just this constant vigilance that you have where you're just aware. You're not afraid, you're just aware. And then we're walking through a shopping centre and I was pointing out to him all of the things that I keep an eye on that he just doesn't even see. Like, I was like, those two teenage boys over there, they're swearing heaps, they're pushing each other, they're kind of eating each other on. Like, I feel I've got to keep an eye on them because they might do something. And just, like, pointing out all the stuff that he's completely unaware is going on, but is going on for me. Yes, I had a conversation on Facebook, which is always the best place to communicate with people. <laughs> I find if you ever really need to find empathy and bonding and common ground with someone, <laughs> go to a Facebook wall. <laughs> Begin a thread, ideally with somebody who's you know, showing low-level hostility. And you'll find in no time at all. And I was trying to explain to this man, because he was saying, oh, men are as unsafe as women. And I was trying to explain that, like, I certainly walk home with my keys between my fingers or just away. I, I walked down the middle of my street. I got mugged in my street a few years ago. And I get, like, these little, I guess they're, like, trauma shocks when someone comes behind me or someone's coming out of an alley or, like, I just feel, to be honest, I get trauma shocks from men. If I see a woman I, or I can feel a sense of the gait of a woman, I don't get that at all. And I'm just so anxious and it took me it's like a few years ago now but it, it's it's still there and for a long time it was really bad like I would jump and some poor person would be like oh oh and I go oh sorry oh, oh, oh. <laughs> um, and uh, so I was trying to explain to him that women get this I think from my experience I don't know I might be wrong I don't want to speak for a woman we're not a monolithic group uh, but just go mm, if you do have a sort of hyper vigilance on the street when it's dark <laughs> just say mm, if you don't know what we're talking about Okay, great. Um, it's just a sort of constant someone might be there and you're just sort of that all the time, like just really aware. And he said, oh, well, when I was a taxi driver, I would feel scared because I'd pick people up at night and sometimes they'd be women, like sort of, I guess, like sort of night type vibe. And he said, they'd get very aggressive with me and I'd say, get out of my cab. And so there's an example of a man being threatened. And I was like, there's an example of a man who can give up the role of being a taxi driver. I know not everyone can afford to do that, but in his case, certainly he could afford to. I can never give up being a woman. I just said, what you've explained is somebody being angry with you and you saying, get out of my cab with great uh, confidence because ultimately they don't have the upper body strength and you're at the wheel. So that is different from the vibe that you sometimes get from a driver who becomes threatening to you. Mm. And he just couldn't see this isn't like a taxi driver role for me. This isn't something that happens between 6 p.m. and 1 a.m. on a Friday night to me. This is always there. And he just would not accept that. And he said, we started talking about how most, you know, by far um, rape victims are female. And he said, oh, well, there are places in Asia where large groups of women hide and then jump out at one man and rape him. And I was like, what? And then she was like, no, there are. There are large groups of women, there are 10 or 12 women, and they gang up on a man, and they collectively tie him down. And I'm like, but can you not see what you're saying? Like, even if that is true, I have no evidence that it's not, but I don't know where you're... I'll need to see research, is what I said. But if that's true, it's 12... You have to round up 12 women to do that. Can you not see? That the strength is... Oh, the logistics of it, for a start. <laughs> Everyone's so busy these days. <laughs> this is a dark joke. <laughs> also, what that taxi driver has just done is put a whole lot of women out onto a dark street. Yes. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> just so I can round up others. Go on a vigilante. <laughs> well, I, I, Please put your hands together for the wonderful Cal Wilson! So I come from a family who are very anxious. Like, we see the worst case scenario in every possible situation. Like, I would describe us as optimistic pessimists. Uh, we believe that the glass is half full, but we're worried someone's put bleach in it. 
so I have always, I've always been very, very conscious of personal safety and, and very conscious, like I, I really do, I look for the worst case scenario in, in everything, like anything that happens, like if my husband hasn't texted me back within 10 minutes, I'm like, no, oh, dead. Um, <laughs> If the cat hasn't eaten its breakfast, dead! Uh, the postie didn't come today, dead! Like, I, I, I'm really conscious of, of physical safety and I'm, I, I sort of refer to myself as an inside cat. Like, I prefer to be inside where things don't happen. I realised that something had changed in me when my son was born and I discovered that I would do anything for him to keep him safe. That I found this kind of thing inside me that I didn't know was happening until he was three weeks old and we were at Hillsville Animal Sanctuary in Melbourne. We'd taken my parents there because they wanted to look at some dry, dusty, bored animals. And they're from New Zealand, they're like, let's look at something lying down. And so, um, like kangaroos scratching their enormous testicles, and, um, like, has it got a handbag? Oh, no. Um, so we are, we are, we are walking through the bit that you can walk through with the emus and the kangaroos and the wallabies and stuff and I've got the baby in the pram and he's three weeks old and I'm looking at him and I'm just like, oh, you are just the most beautiful little thing. And I look up and I see this massive emu walking towards us and I make eye contact with it and it looks at me and I had this very clear thought in my head of, if you come any closer, I will fuck you up! <laughs> and I was like, I will break your legs, I will tie your neck in a knot, it's your time to die, big chicken! <laughs> I was just full of this rage of like, you will not harm my child. Like, was it, you know, in hindsight, I would not have won. Like, you know, I would... <laughs> but at the time, I was just full of this rage of like, I don't care what my safety is. Like, I was like, trying to figure out in my head of how I would take it down, like an ankle tap or something, and just knock it sideways, or wrap its neck around the pram handle, or, or something like that. I was like, I will do anything to defend that child. Like, I will be a lioness for that child. And it happened again when he was about five. And, you know, I still liked him in between those times, but <laughs> it was another real illustration to me of how my own sense of personal safety had changed and what I would do for that child. Because I'm, I'm quite a meek person, I don't like confrontation. No, I hate conflict of any sort. Like, I, um, I did an entirely different degree at university than the one I was intending to do, because the lecture hours clashed with the hours I worked part-time at the supermarket, and I was too scared of the supervisor to ask her to change my hours. <laughs> That is some fancy bullshit, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I once also accidentally got engaged because I was too embarrassed to tell my new boyfriend that I'd been joking when I went, marry me after a particularly nice shag. So... <laughs> Don't worry, I didn't let it go on for too long. We were only married for eight months, so that was fine. Um, <laughs> I have a lovely husband now. He's my favourite. So... Um, <laughs> I, I hate any sort of conflict and confrontation, right? So we are at a, a fair, me and my son are at this fair, and he is with his little friend Chloe, and they want to get their faces painted. And so they get their faces painted. Chloe wants a rainbow butterfly, and so my son Digby wants a rainbow butterfly as well. And they get their faces painted up with these big rainbow butterflies, and he's just feeling fantastic, and she's feeling fantastic, and they run off to play in the playground. I'm like, that is so gorgeous. One day I'll buy him a pink bike. And... Um, <laughs> Like, they, they're so happy, and then I'm, I'm just watching them play, and then about 15 minutes later, my son comes running back to me, and he has tears running down his face, and he goes, Mum, that boy over there said I looked stupid. He said I looked like a girl. And I was full of these two huge, simultaneous emotions, and one was my heart broke, because I saw that my son had just had that moment where he discovered he couldn't be who he was. Like, he couldn't be how he wanted to be in the world, and he was going to have to conform to other people's ideas and expectations. And the second emotion that I was full of was, I will have revenge. <laughs> I was just full of this fury, right? And the thing is, right, you never tell off someone else's child, right? You never tell off another person's child because if I'm a lioness for my son, every other child has a lion or a lioness or a, a lion and a lioness or a lioness and a lioness or a lion and a lion or whatever combination of big cat predator. Every other child has one or two or three of those looking after them, right? But I was so angry. This kid was over by the slide. He was about nine years old and I went over and I just, I was so angry that he had hurt my son. And I went over and went, you don't make fun of other people for how they look. How would you like it if someone was mean to you just because of what you had on your face? If he feels great, then he looks fantastic. And what's wrong with being a girl anyway? I've been a girl for ages and I like it! <laughs> And 
then his mum came over. And she had seen what had happened and I was like, oh my God, it's my time to die, big chicken. <laughs> but she comes over, she's seen what had happened and she was pissed off as well. And she starts telling her son off and I'm like, I have turned a mother against her young. Like I was, <laughs> couldn't believe it. And I was like, oh my God, she's totally telling him off and that's really great and I did the right thing. And then she leads him back to their picnic spot and as they're about to sit down, she hits him. And I was like, oh, fuck fuck, that's not what I wanted to happen. Like, I didn't, I just wanted him to be more empathetic towards my son. And I was like, what do I do? Do I say something to her? But if I say something to her, does that make it worse? But I really want her to know that that's not the way you should communicate with your kids and that he needs to be shown the right way to behave. And I should have said something, but she was quite a tall woman. And I was just like, well, if she's that big, imagine how big her mum would be. And... <laughs> So all I could do was go back to my son and tell him that he looked amazing and that it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks of you, that you follow your own path and if you want to be a rainbow butterfly, that that's what you are and that you just you do your own thing and that, that I loved him and I thought he looked fantastic. But from that day on, he refused to ever have his face painted again. Um, so I'm forced to do it to him while he's asleep. Um, obviously, obviously, I don't do that, but if I hadn't said that, it would just be a sad story with a sad ending. So I lied for you. and make fabulous, guilty fabulous noises for our wonderful guest, comedian Susie Youssef. Hello. Hello. Oh, you're high, aren't you? I am higher. Oh, are you higher than me? I'm a yeah. feminist, but I enjoy being higher. Yeah, no, it's good. <laughs> that is good. What do you feel about safety, Susie? So, a couple of thoughts. So many at once. Try and articulate them, Susan. Um, <laughs> my first thought was, and I think this happens to a lot of people when you think about safety, is that it triggers a memory of a time when you were felt unsafe. And that time for me was uh, last year I went to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, not showing off, but I did lose a lot of money. And, uh, <laughs> and I was staying with a group of comedians in an apartment in Marchmont across the meadows, and there were some nights where I stayed out late, and, um, <laughs> and I would have to walk across the meadows, and not always were there any of my housemates to walk with me. One particular night, I was walking home quite late and I was followed by someone. And I knew that he was following me because you know when someone's following you because yeah. you take turns that you wouldn't usually and they take them and then you're like, gotcha, I'm unsafe. Um, <laughs> and I had this moment where I remembered a story that my brother-in-law had told me about him being on a train. And a guy who thought that he'd gone to primary school with my brother-in-law came up to him very drunk was sitting very close, was quite an imposing man. Now, my brother-in-law is a Caribbean gentleman who lives in, uh, <laughs> he sounds like a character. Anyway, he, um, <laughs> he's a pretty fit dude, but the guy that was on the train was much bigger than him and he felt unsafe. And his reaction, and he told me this story, was that he thought I should be crazier than the crazy. <laughs> So as I walked home, so he did, he acted like a crazy person and the guy got a bit freaked out, spooked him and he left the train carriage. He didn't tell me specifically what he did, but that was the thought that I had when I was followed home by this guy. And as I got to a large bush of flowers, I thought, let's be crazier than the crazy. And I picked a flower and I spoke quite loudly to it. <laughs> Were you like, I am taking you from your family? I actually said, you never understand. <laughs> but I finished, I finished the scene, the, the, my performance. The scene. And scene. I finished it with, and that's all I'll say about that, period. Right? When I told my brother-in-law that, he said, Perfect, because there's no way he'd want to talk to you if you were ending conversations with period. <laughs> and I was that, that opened a whole lot of other questions. I was like, why? Because he thought I was talking about periods or he didn't like people at, like announcing their punctuation. I don't know what the issue was. <laughs> but he was like, no, that's so crazy. Like, no one does that anymore. And then I thought, but I did do that. <laughs> and now I don't know if I'm the most safe idiot on the street. <laughs> Or just an idiot. Did he think you 
alone after that? Did he go away? So he did go away. The guy did go away. So I, I know that he did because... Thank you so much. Um, I know that he left. I know that he didn't follow me any further. Twice more during the Edinburgh Fringe Festival, I was followed home. Uh, the great thing about being in another, uh, on the other side of the world is that I had WhatsApp on my phone and I would just call home as I walked home. At one point, my mother said to me, what am I going to do if he follows you again? I'm all the way over here. And I said, it's, the point is to distract me from the situation, not <laughs> to, to do what work. you're doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> to make, yeah, not to make it worse. Not to make it worse. And she said, in all fairness, I think you should probably talk to the flower again. That seemed to work the first time. <laughs> She's not helpful. So that was the first. That was the first thing I thought of when we discussed that we were going to speak about safety. The other thing is another. Uh, my mother is linked to this story also in an unhelpful way. Um, I grew up in Western Sydney. I went to school in Western Sydney. Yeah. And I'm not saying that that influences the story, but it absolutely does. Um, <laughs> there was a man that would stand at my bus stop in Parramatta. We called him the chicken man because he would throw raw chicken at us before we got on the bus. No. Yes. In broad daylight. Not just a really enthusiastic butcher. Not like just... No, he wasn't giving us samples. Uh, he, he was terrifying. He was terrifying. Oh my God. But the first time so that it not happened, what I thought you were going to say at all. <laughs> Could not have anticipated this. No, 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 no. and I didn't have not thought about this story in a hundred years. The first thing that I thought when this happened to me was not to feel fear of this very heavily tattooed, aggressive man throwing chicken at me and calling me the c word. I thought, oh, chicken's a volatile meat. <laughs> That was my first thought, that my mother had, my whole life, said over and over again, raw chicken, volatile meat, chicken's <laughs> volatile meat. And I looked at my friend Kate, who had been hit by the chicken, and my first thought again wasn't, oh no, she's been hit by something, a man has aggressively attacked her with something. I thought, oh, I hope she didn't breathe it in. Like, that was my problem. She thought she was going to get salmonella. Totally. Salmonella, giardia, these were all of the early 90s. These were the things that we were scared of. <laughs> Looking back, they were good days. They really were. Now, I don't want you to think I lead a charmed life. I've had way scarier stories, but they were the, t the first They're the, two. the ones that stood out. Yeah. yeah. They're and the ones I've spoken to a therapist about. It's also sometimes where you're scared of something because of experience. Once in Edinburgh, I'd been to this, it was like the official, it was like the Edinburgh Comedy Award party thing, and everyone was trying to get taxis at the end. And I'd called a minicab. And when the guy came, it was just like a guy in a car. And I thought he was my guy, but it wasn't, it was before Uber or anything, when you know, you'd know the number plate. So I leaned in and I said, are you my taxi? And he said, you have to say your name, because lots of people are trying to get taxis. And I just suddenly went, then I don't have any evidence. I'm the one getting into the car. Like, it's better that I get into the wrong taxi mm. than I get into a random man's car. So I just said, look, would you mind saying the name? And he said, I'm not going to attack you. And he was really aggressive. He was oh, like, wow. he was so angry with me. It's like, basically, you're calling me a rapist. And I was like, no, 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 no. I was like, you're like, not like, yet. <laughs> and I was like, I was like, no, 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 no. And I said, why don't you ring my number? And if my phone rings, you know that it's the right person. Oh, you are so much smarter and than I am. So... <laughs> So, he, so he, he rang the number and my phone rang. I said, see, I'm the right person. So we're all good now. So I then got in the car and then he just started going off on one about, you know, like not trusting him and like, why would you think that? Like, why do women assume uh, that men are out to attack them? And I was like, like because of this conversation. And I was right like, now. oh my God. And I was being so nice. So my strategy was to be incredibly nice and do my breezy brisk business manner and I was saying oh no 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 it's not you we're just told you know that like and I started saying you know that minicab campaign like I only want to get in an authentic minicab like yours because I can trust you but I don't want to get into one of those inauthentic minicabs because there was all those campaigns about those guys other other guys not you yeah. good guy other guys <laughs> being right but you are a good guy and that's why I'm in your cab and it's good to check isn't it because of you and me both being really lovely humans and doing a big like negotiation dance to lower the hostility but also make him feel trusted because that became key. Anyway, he starts driving and driving and I sort of 
I think, I don't know, I was on my phone or something and I was just sort of like, then I looked up and I thought, where the fuck are we? And I lived in town and the party was in town. And suddenly we were on this country road I'd never been on outside Edinburgh and I thought, oh God, I'm dead. And so I thought, right, I need to get the police number ready to dial and work out where I am. And I, it was like before Saturn, it wasn't smartphones. So I, I think I put the police number in and then I said, I'm just checking where we are because th I don't recognise this. And he said, were well, you going to Smithson Road? It was way out of Edinburgh. And I went, oh, no, 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 I'm going to Smithson Place. And he went, oh, well, that's back in town. <laughs> and I went, yeah, yeah, it's just over the meadows. And he went, oh, fucking hell, I'm driven all the way out here now. And I was like, oh, it's all right, it's all right, we'll just go back. And he went back and he dropped me home and it was absolutely fine. But my heart was beating because I'd had that experience. And we trade off the experience of what we've had before. We're constantly getting ourselves out of trouble. We're constantly talking ourselves out of trouble. But in movies now, women karate their way out of trouble. I think we only ever use verbal karate. Well, certainly I generally use verbal karate. Yeah. Or pick flowers, whatever is available to you. Yeah, but that is a verbal karate. It's Absolutely, a yeah. It's, it's a weird move. Yeah, I, a, I, it's I a teach workshops. Um, no, I don't. <laughs> Who would take a workshop that I teach? Um, I would, Susie. I, I would so. go to your out crazy, the crazy workshop. But it does happen. There is a feeling... Um, I mean, there's probably a smarter way to say this and it won't be coming from my mouth, but... Um, <laughs> But we do get this, we do have this like intense anxiety that's primal, that there is fear coming and we, and we have way more hormones that flood our body than are necessary. But for every 10 times that that happens, you are in danger. Oh yeah, there is oh, a time I, would say one in danger. I would say one and two, I mean, I'm in danger. And I feel like I've talked my way out of a number of situations. And having other situations, you know, I found a man in my bedroom, you know, and had to talk my way out of that and, you know. I thought you were bragging, but now I realise what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm, I'm a feminist, but I did think you were brave. No. <laughs> it was not a man I had invited in. He wasn't there when I went to sleep, but he was oh there when God. I woke up. That is fucking terrifying. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, it was another makeup incident. He had my makeup case. It was like one of those silver Max Factor boxes that you got free with stuff. And I think he thought it was a camera case. He just went, stay there. And this real James L. Jones voice. And I went, there's any makeup in that. So I thought, he's just going to throw it. Anyway, it's like, I don't know what it is. It's something... Oh, he's just going to throw it away. And I, it's something that comes over me. I freeze and I'm really kind of quite calm in those situations. But the only thing, and it's happened three times, I will defend is makeup. <laughs> Listen, it takes so long to collect. Yeah, and if it gets discontinued, it's, it's the worst. It's really yeah. expensive. You've got this half a Laura Mercier primer that you can't afford to replace. Yeah. You've got that MAC eyeshadow that you've spent too much on and it's only for Christmas, but you do use it every yeah. year. You spend so three years colour matching as well, so... What sort of hard. eyeshadow are you using only for Christmas? Oh, it's those eyeshadow, like it's a sparkly silver, it's like a smoky sparkle. I always think it was like red and green or something like... <laughs> it's Elf's eyeliner. No, I, it's, I just feel like... <sighs> no, I completely, I completely Elf's got her agree. child. Yes. I would probably go, take the baby, leave the estate order. I'm the same with, I, I am the same with luggage. So I don't have any children, but I do have luggage. Um, <laughs> I think that, that's something to be done. I think I normally call that baggage. Yeah. Well, <laughs> both. Both. The way I carry it, it's so stylish. Um, but, they're like, she's fucked up. Um, <laughs> I was in, this is not, this doesn't start out funny, but I'm alive. Um, I was in a taxi. That's how all great stories start. It doesn't start out funny, but I'm alive. Spoiler. I was in a taxi in Melbourne at the end of the comedy festival with some very nice luggage in the boot of the car. And the taxi driver, there was something a bit twitchy and off about him. And I knew it as soon as I closed the door, I went, oh, fuck. Like, I was really scared. And then I was like, come on, you're an anxious person, you'll be fine. I did some four, seven, eight breathing. It was okay for a minute. Then he picked up his mobile phone and he went, ah. Oh. And I stupidly said, oh. That's all I said. And he said, I've been sexting this girl <laughs> and she's up to the stakes and now I'm driving you to the airport. And then he put his hand back with his phone in it and gave it to me and said, can I dictate to you? 
Oh. Are you fucking serious? This is one of the most terrifying so experiences. Was, was this a taxi company or an this Uber? This was a taxi company. Fucking hell. I've never been so scared in my whole life because that's quite a long drive. My luggage was in, you know, we know how I feel about my luggage. <laughs> it was in the back. <laughs> and a couple of like cheeky thoughts happened at the same time as the terror. So the first was, you really emphasise the dick in dictate. And I, I get it. Um, <laughs> You're scary already, mate. And then the other one was, like, what if he asks me to freestyle? I'm not very good at this. <laughs> That's going to be... Like, and I did... Because you know when you're terrified and your mind... And you're an idiot and your mind goes, oh, well, what about this hilarious thing? And then the, the really, really scared part of me immediately texted a friend who was down in Melbourne and said, call me immediately. And he called and I said, I'm so sorry to take this call. Uh, right now and he was like oh uh, he was just such an angry man mm. and I stayed on the phone with my friend and he was texting as he drove he was swerving in and out of traffic and I felt so unsafe but when I got out of the cab with luggage next to me <laughs> I leant in and I said to him that was not good what you did and he goes you wouldn't even help me and I said and I've noted down your number and then I burst into tears and another taxi driver stopped so that he couldn't move and got out and dealt with the situation and called oh. the company. Oh. And, and even though I am a hugely inarticulate human being, I was so happy to get that voice, like that scream out, and call it in that moment because had I had even a second longer, I would have overthought it and gone inside and probably never spoken about and it again. And it's that permission in the moment to stand up for yourself where it is safe to do so. Yeah. Hi, I'm Mae Martin. I'm Bisha K. Ali. And I'm Ned Sedgwick. And we're so excited to welcome you to a new podcast from BBC Radio 4, Grown Up Land. Each week, join us as we take a topic from the adult world that we're struggling to get our heads around and look to the grown up land of Radio 4 for answers and advice. Yeah, we really only look at the big, philosophically complex issues. How close do we have to be for you to get a friendship tattoo with me? I could do it for you. Oh, really? I've done it with a needle and um, a Bic pen. Like Wait, a, a needle and a Bic... Were you in prison? No, I was at a dinner party and things got out what? of hand. I mean, that is an out-of-hand dinner. When a dinner party gets out of hand for me, we crack into their parents' port. Like, we know. <laughs> <laughs> Not only that, but every week I'll roam grown-up land in search of a new challenge. I've literally just pierced my ear for this program and I have some regrets. So I just got a phone to a couple of piercers. I'm just going to go and get a simple ear piercing, just walk in. A lot of people weren't okay with me recording it. Not really sure what they didn't want me recording. Just relax. I'll try. And you're done. Oh, How was it? Uh, <laughs> the kind of fear of the pain has passed and now the fear of my friend seeing the saddest mate with a piercing has kind of set in. <laughs> You'll also be joined by a special guest each week to try to unpick your dilemmas and solve your problems. This week, our guest is Ed Knight. He's a stand-up comedian. He was nominated for Best Newcomer at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival this year. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me. Okay, this is a question from at Hensers. When I was 10, I wanted to be an accountant desperately. <laughs> Maths was always my fave subject. I ended up in recruitment, and now I'm kind of lost. It sounds like mm. their bliss is accounting. Yeah. Follow your bliss. Yeah. yeah. And also make do it you. your side hustle until your side hustle becomes your hustle. Like, yeah. just do it on the side. Start writing sums in the dust on cars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Toilet walls. Whatever. And the amazing Steve Ellie will put everything in perspective for us. Here's another question. This is from at Imaginary Really, who says, I want to get a tattoo to piss off my parents, but I can't decide what to get. Ideas for tattoos that will annoy my parents the most, please. Um, so this sounds like it's time for Steve Ali's perspective. Steve is from Syria and he's here every week to help us with the questions that we can't crack ourselves. Steve? Hey, Imaginary Really. Your problem reminds me of the time when I was living with my parents. They used to annoy me and sometimes I wanted to do things to piss them off. But then when civil war broke out in Syria when I was 19 and we had to flee and I had to leave them, I found that me having to get across dangerous borders and message them whenever I could get signal from refugee camps freaked them out so much more than anything else I could do. 
So I recommend if you really want to piss your parents off, go stateless and let police, border <laughs> police and international governments do it for you. So welcome to Grown Up Land. Make sure you subscribe so you can catch our adventures in the terrifying adult world on a weekly basis. Would you please welcome to the stage the amazing Deborah Frances White! So I was 18 years old. I was a Jehovah's Witness, and I was standing at an open door that I had previously knocked on. And there was a man at the door, six foot four, six foot five, huge guy. He looked down at me and he said, well, I guess you girls better come in. So I looked at my friend Annie, who I was at the door with. We were both 18 years of age, dressed a lot like Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> and I didn't know what to do because I had never been invited in before. It's rarer than you'd think. <laughs> There's not a lot of tea and buns. It's mostly just, no. And I thought, well, he's obviously interested. And Annie looked at me and I looked at Annie and he started walking down this long corridor. And so we just followed him because there was nothing else to do. And I heard the door close behind Annie. And we kept walking and kept walking and kept walking down this incredibly long corridor right to the back of this house. And when we got into this big back room, there were 10 or 12 bikers all lying around, some sort of semi-comatosed, the smell of pot in the air, booze in the air. And the chap who had invited us in said, my name's Nigel. <laughs> These girls have something to tell us, boys. Why don't you girls sit down? So we sat down on this sofa and we started saying, do you ever worry about the future? <laughs> As was our spiel at that time. <laughs> Ironic, really. As it was clearly us who should be worried about the very near future. And he said, no, I just kind of live day to day. Fine, that's the best policy. I'm like, good, yeah, that's good policy too. That's good, good policy. But sometimes you might worry about what's happening in the world. What is happening in the world? Just, you know, bad things like war, what wars. Just the... Anyway, he starts sort of cat and mousing us. And eventually he looks at me and he says, um, so are you girls allowed to have sex before marriage? And we looked at each other and went, no, no. No, we're not. No, no, I'm not. No. And are you married? No. So you're virgins. And I remember thinking, not for much longer. <laughs> and I looked at Annie and I thought, God, how long before anybody realises we are here? Because... What happens when you're working as young Jehovah's Witnesses? You go to this door, your partners go to the next door, and then you go house over house over house. But often you will lose people because they, maybe they got into a good conversation, maybe you got into a good conversation, and then they went home. I mean, good conversation, loose <laughs> turn of phrase looking back. Now, I see, as a, as a sort of feminist atheist now, I sort of look back on those good conversations as more mediocre conversations. <laughs> But if at that time you got into a conversation with somebody who was interested in what you had to say and then they couldn't find you, they would just go home or they'd think you had gone home. And I thought, so how long before anyone is going to work out that we are missing? And I thought, well, if I'm not home by 10 o'clock, my flatmate would alert somebody. But the problem was my flatmate was the girl sitting next to me. <laughs> so I just said, oh... I think we'd better go. And he said, oh, no. Why don't you girls sit down and have a beer? And so I sat down again. And he starts coming closer 
and closer and playing more cat and mouse and more cat and mouse until I just thought, like, okay, if we're not going to get out of here alive, which is possible, I should die doing the thing that God wants me to do. Because I was very devout, obviously. It was a weekday. <laughs> and I was inside his house with a Bible and a watchtower. <laughs> the thing is, under the Jehovah's Witnesses doctrine, if you're raped and you don't scream, uh, you will die and you won't be resurrected at Armageddon because Jehovah will never forgive you for that. And I remember saying to this elder, but what if he's got a knife to my throat and what if I could die? Should I scream then? And he said, it's better to die as a loyal worshipper of Jehovah than to live as a fornicator. So my great fear was always like, what if I freeze? What if I can't scream? So I was doing two things. One, I was preparing to scream. I was kind of going... <coughs> <laughs> And all there was to drink was beer. And I was like, I really shouldn't be drinking this beer. But I was sort of moistening. <laughs> this is awful. This is so dark. Moistening my throat. <laughs> and also going, right, if I'm going to go out, I've got to go out giving a witness. Because that's the best thing you can do. Giving a witness for the kingdom. I've got to tell them about God's kingdom. So I looked around the room and I said, do you ever wonder why bad things happen to good people? mentally adding in my head, like this right now to me. <laughs> and a guy who's like short and bald, who'd been lying on the carpet, sort of seemed half awake, he just propped himself up and said, yeah, I do. I do, because my mum died when I was a little boy, and if there was a loving God, why would he let that happen? And I said, well, that's a really good point. And I opened the Watchtower magazine, which that month was dealing with this issue, and it had a picture inside of a man uh, looking sad but holding the Bible, and it had a scripture underneath that said that God knows all of your tears and he will capture them all in his bottle. And he looked and he sort of looked like, oh, that's really beautiful. And he came a bit closer and I kind of came a bit closer and he took the watchtower out of my hand and he just softened. And it was just this lovely moment. And then Nigel stood up and went, I think you girls better go. And we got up and we ran to the corridor and we ran down the corridor and we ran out the door into the street and we ran all the way back to the car. And I must give you this advice. If you are in a hostage situation and you have a Watchtower magazine, <laughs> you should use it. Thank you very much. for our challenge this week that we would like to do some self-defense. Deborah wanted to wrestle me, okay? <laughs> That's what it's really all about. I suggested an underwear pillow fight. And Cal was all like, oh, it would be safer if we did it on stage. Now, no woman should have to do self-defense. But I've noticed since I've done more yoga, if a guy has been hassling me, I've just felt that following feeling in Camden. I've just felt like a personal power and permission to go, I'm quite strong, actually. Just going in downward dog and, and being like, come out another <laughs> time. <laughs> I've just done a quick plank to demonstrate the point. <laughs> and she was like, yeah, just come back in four minutes, I'll still be going. <laughs> and apparently, that's not proper behaviour on the tube. But <laughs> I got in trouble. But anyway... There are some women who are disabled. There are some women who cannot do this for all sorts of reasons or just don't want to, and that's absolutely fair. But I was interested in it for my own core strength, sort of mental strength. Today, I found what I can now consider to be one of the most wonderful young women in Sydney. And she is going to come and tell her story of her journey into self-defense and show us some moves. Uh, so please, put your hands together for the wonderful Elaine. Hello everyone, I'm Elaine. Okay, so Elaine, thank you so much for joining us. You are doing Wing Chun? Wing Chun. Why did you start doing this? It's happened for quite some time where I do feel unsafe on the streets. So basically one time I was at a bus stop in Penrith and I was completely 
absolutely ugly, had terrible jeans, very sweaty from work, I worked at a cafe. And a man came up to me and said, hello. And because I was taught to be polite, I said, well, I don't know who this man is, but I said, hello back. Next second, he's leaning in towards me, trying to kiss me. And I freeze up, but the only thing I was able to say was, what the hell? And because I was loud and I yelled, everybody looked at him and then he walked away. And I felt really unsafe and I didn't know what to do and I was stuck in my seat. And the man next to me says, oh, you know, when you hit 70, you've got nothing going for you. And it's like, do you know that man? And he's like, oh, no, definitely not. And it's like, oh, well, thanks for helping me. <laughs> And so I told my friend, after several times of, you know, I've been followed before from the park, and... Um, she take flowers with you. Oh, no, there was no flowers there, so... <laughs> yeah, you've got to be prepared. <laughs> yeah. Susie's retraining as a florist. <laughs> yeah. I'm so sorry, Elaine. Oh, that's all right. Um, and so I was followed to work one day, and this man asked me to talk to him, and I noticed, I didn't realise he had followed me all the way to work, and I turned around and I was like, excuse me? And he's like, come here. He was gesturing that we talk in the quiet hallway. And I was like, no. And then he walked away and I called the police. I spoke to a female officer saying, I think I was followed to work and I don't think I'm the only woman he's followed. Could you please do something about this? And the female officer says, well, you know, he could have just been asking you for directions. How, what should I do about it? He could, this was the only time you were followed. I'm like, but I'm not the only one. Yeah, so after that, I told my male friend, hey, you know, I feel really unsafe and I thought other people would back me up, but I feel like no one believes me. What do you think I should do? I don't see myself doing any martial arts. I'm really weak, I'm uncoordinated. Like, I don't like confrontation. And he said, well, why don't you look at Wing Chun? It's designed by a woman. It's good for defeating opponents who are bigger and stronger than you are. Give it a go. So I did. And after six months of training there, I was really uncoordinated. I had my red, my pink nails, my pink shirt. Completely freaked out. But everyone treated me like an equal. And um, this little old lady looks like the kind that would do crocheting. Very quiet, very nice. She's like, just come at me. I want you to try and choke me. Oh. I was like, um, um, really? She's like, yeah, just do it. I'll show you. And then I try and choke her, I lunge at her. She does a double dice out, which is like literally like making a triangle with your arms. You literally raise it just above your head, like so, and knocks me back and does a palm strike to my shoulders. She knocks me back further and I'm on the ground going, how did that happen? I was like, I, I could be like this old lady, yeah. Man, first of all, she had crocheting needles, so I'd be like, I fucking know this trick, mate. <laughs> But then she is 70, so she had nothing else going for her. Nothing <laughs> <laughs> else going on. <laughs> she had nothing else going on. <laughs> Such an insult to 70 year olds, I've just realised as well. Only 70 year olds have got loads going on. I really hate that now. Anyway. So why I've chosen Wing Chun is just because it's so easy and the people that do train it, they're very non-aggressive. Violence is only, you know, it's the last resort. resort. Have you ever used it? Since you've been learning it? Yes. Actually, six months after I've learnt it. Did you go back and find that guy? <laughs> <laughs> I did it. Two men like, found me. Just, just like rushing you back to go. Into old I hear going. you don't have much going on. <laughs> what do you do now, motherfucker? <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to have a new year. When did you actually use it? So, uh, one time where it was Halloween, six months after I was studying it. In front of my workplace, thought I would be safe, it was dark, two men were drinking. They were wolf whistling at us and so we ignored them. We didn't want to make the situation worse, we ignored them, we walked away until one actually ran after us. He grabbed my friend, pulls her around and says, hey gorgeous, and starts trying to proposition her. So immediately, without thinking, I grab his hand, throw it off, double palm strike him in the chest, <laughs> knocking him back, one meter and a half, yelling at him. I yell at him saying, you're being inappropriate. How dare you touch her? Get back, get back or I'll make you regret it. It was not very open, but it worked.
Uh, because Elaine's not a trainer, she's a young yeah. woman who is learning Wing Chun and defending herself and using it as she goes. And that's really why I wanted her here tonight. Do you think that just knowing that you have that ability has made you move through the world in a different way? Like, do you go, I'm now equipped, I can use my voice, whether or not I'm using my body, mm. I can use my voice to speak up and to stand up? That's, and r that's right. I'm able to say no to a lot of things now. I was quite shy and very self-conscious, uh, very anxious before Kung Fu as well. Now I tell people no. And when people ask me to do things I don't want to do, I just say, no, I don't want to do it. I, I think there's so much to power in the body. Like just, and for whatever that ability is, you know, look, I'm never going to be as fit as Elaine because, you know, Elaine's 25. That's right. um, but, and I'm not as slight or probably as athletic as Elaine, but I, from my place and from wherever that place is for you to find some physical power, even if that's breathing every day, just feeling your core strength, it's such an amazing thing to do. Elaine, what I would love is for you to do some YouTube videos in association with The Guilty Feminist so that we can learn from you because I think people would really love it and the fact that you're not an instructor, that you are a regular person like us, I think would be amazing. Would you guys watch that if you did? This is not... This isn't an advert. I've just come up with this on the stage. I, I know I want to hear Elaine go, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> and then just double palm me. <laughs> Fuck you. Fuck you in your videos. I'm not a YouTuber. What are you saying? Um, tonight, here, live on the podcast, would you show us some simple techniques? Yes, we can definitely do that. We'll do some arm grabs, I think. Some arm grabs. Yeah, I am too grabs. scared to say no. Look at that face. <laughs> yes, we will do some arm grabs. All right, who would like to be my... Uh... Kick my butt, Elaine. <laughs> do it. <laughs> Is it helpful if I hold the microphone for you? Okay. Just so that I feel validated. <laughs> At the end when you say, you're acting inappropriate because it's a scenario. Um, <laughs> can you go, period? <laughs> <laughs> dancing guard, you'll probably be standing normally in realistic situations, but this will help you. <laughs> <laughs> so we stand Susie, if you're listening at home, Susie's standing naturally in inverted commas. <laughs> she's standing like she's on the cover of a knitting pattern. <laughs> so Susie, if you could face me dead straight on, stand really nice and tall. Shoulders relax, like you have a crown on your head. I would like you to have your feet together, straight. You're going to point your toes, you're going to bend slightly at the knee, like you're leaning a little. You're going to put your toes outwards, point out, little triangle, then you're gonna point in again. We're going to make a small triangle with our hands just in front of us. This is not the do you want the audience just to sort of do the bit with their hands? Yeah. yeah. Or the feet. Yeah, they could do feet and hands from just where you're sitting. <laughs> All right. So now we're like nice and relaxed. We have our little triangle. We're going to bring one hand back and keep one forward. One is for striking and the other is for defense. <laughs> so, Susie, could you please try and grab my right hand? <laughs> <laughs> one hand my other. So I just heard you say how good you are. Why am I doing this? <laughs> okay. So just grab my hand. If the person has their thumb over your wrist, you can do a uh, pullback. So you just literally pull the front hand back using the rotation in your shoulder, pulling back through the wrist and the elbow, and you're going to throw a straight punch down their centre line. <laughs> Susie's looking very, very scared. I'm not going to hit you. I'm uh, not scared. Okay. <laughs> Period. Now I'm scared. <laughs> All right. I would like you to now just grab me really quickly. And we do draw back and punch at the screen at the same time. Okay. We're, we're out of range, so I won't hit you. It's okay. <laughs> so one more time. Oh so God, I forget all the moves. So I just grab my hand, I'll be doing demonstrations okay. and then I want you to do it. So okay. just grab my wrist, draw back and punch straight down the line. I'm going <laughs> So Susie is going to now do it. Yeah. Now Susie with the straight punch. This, the hand that's back, I want you to turn into a fist 
at the last second of okay. doing the strike, yeah, yeah. connecting with the bottom three knuckles of your hand with my hand here, and I'm going to grab your wrist now, and I want you to draw back and punch the other hand okay. that I have. So draw back now. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Susie landed the punch if you're listening at home. And I don't even have the upper arm strength to keep the microphone up for this long. Because <laughs> I'm holding it in place so you can hear Elaine. And already I'm going, oh, this is a bit tough on the arms. <laughs> can I do it again? Yes. Now, if you're not confident using a punch, you can use a palm strike. Okay. It's actually a lot more effective, actually. Because yep. you don't think too hard about it. So I want you to My punch. thighs are seizing up, by the way. Oh, yeah. So, like, again, just, if you become really tense, you just shake it off and you just... Reset. It's all about being relaxed because okay. you'll be faster and stronger that way. Yeah. All right. So, yeah. So, guard. I'm going to grab your wrist. Okay. Palm struck my hand. It's like literally. Can I swap hands? Yes, okay. you can. So I'm going to grab her wrist, and you're just going to palm strike this. Okay. Good. <laughs> that was impressive. She gets, so, so that's something you could do if you're actually grabbed. Yes. Can you show us something else? Can you show Cal and me something? Yeah, definitely. What can you show us? So if someone is pulling you along and they're trying to drag you to a dark alleyway, you want to resist the first few times of pulling, but at the very last second, you're going to turn your elbow towards their... Is that called a sternum? The, yes, you're going to turn your elbow towards their sternum, and when they pull on the very last time, which is usually the third time, which is really strong, you're going to step in with your elbow aiming for that center. So I'm going to do it. I'm not going to actually hit Cal. That's, Good news. That's <laughs> so, Cal, could you please uh, try and drag me along, and then on the last second, with my wrist out, I want you to to try and pull me along. It's actually the hand that they've um. Yes, that's right. It's like really I, I dangerous will, I will do dancing. These <laughs> Can I just check at this point what level of insurance we have, Jeff? <laughs> Enough? Yeah, we're insured. Good. I think we just got home and contents. <laughs> I feel like right, I so want to do a, one quick can I do a sound check? <laughs> we don't have copyright clearance. <laughs> it's a new we never worry about that. It's a podcast. No one chases you on the internet. It's like they don't listen. <laughs> copyright people aren't going to get all the way through to here. Do that. Do that. It's really good. Okay, ready? We'll do it together. Dun, I'll mix it up. Dun, 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 Okay, now Cal's gonna do it. Ready? Okay, here we go. It's a very non-aggressive place. However, the martial art is very effective. I highly suggest everyone try it, just for its self-confidence, to have fun, and to, uh, to stay safe out there. Yeah. Well done. <laughs> um, we shouldn't have to do it, we don't have to do it, but if we wish to take power and permission, we absolutely can, and there's no reason why we shouldn't. What's that word that I learned backstage that I have to remember forever? Uh, about the suffragettes. Yeah, oh, say this out loud instead of just thinking. Suffragitsu. Oh, oh yeah, jitsu. suffragitsu. The suffragettes did jujitsu. Look it up. They really did. We looked it up and they were all... Totally. They started out because they would get attacked at rallies and things, and they would wear cardboard around their breasts. Then they thought, fuck this. 
And I started learning jiu-jitsu. And uh, yes, they could yeah. fend off attackers. So pretend that I didn't do that bit where I thought out loud and then I just said this bit where I'm like, oh, you know what we should talk to everyone about? Suffragitsu. <laughs> remember when the suffragettes did jiu-jitsu? Totally do Good remember times. that. Thank you, Deborah. <laughs> All right, so Cal's going to read out this little bit. Cal, do oh, Susie, do you have anything to plug? Oh, nah. <laughs> I've just had so much fun, I've forgotten where everything. Do, where do we follow you then? So we can um, see what you do. Yeah, I'm on the internet and, uh, and well, also... I, like, everywhere on the internet. internet. <laughs> no, I, um, I just finished filming a show called Squinters that's going to be on the ABC early next year. Yes. And are you at Susie Youssef? I, I think I am, yes. At Susie Youssef or something like that. Yeah. Um, Susie also has a market garden that specialises in flowers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> flowers that are fierce as fuck. <laughs> Anything to plug? Uh, my, I'm doing a comedy festival show next year. It's called Hindsight. You can find it in all major bookstores. You can't, you can't. You can find it at the comedy festival. <laughs> Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane, Canberra, Adelaide. I'm Deborah Francis White, and you can follow me at Deborah FW. You can follow Cal at Calbo. Calbo, C A L B O. It's got nothing. It's got nothing to do with body odor. Although I realise when I spell it out, C A L B O. Woo, stinky. Uh, I'm at Timber FW and I would love you to listen to Global Pillage at globalpillage.net, my diversity-based comedy panel show. It's like all those comedy panel shows you see on the television, except we let women play. And uh, also there is a special episode called The Negotiations uh, a Special, which you can download. It's the only, everything's free all of the time, except one episode, five pounds or whatever that is in your currency. These days, five dollars because of Brexit. <laughs> Used to be like two hundred dollars, and now it's... <laughs> And now it's four ninety nine because motherfuckers. Um, but uh, now, who's who's got a charity, by the way? I am with Moms for Refugees. We support refugees and asylum seekers in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane. We really need your help. Um, so we do material aid, legal support, medical and social, and we are really, really struggling. So. Please help us out. We're dying out here. Okay, so you're gonna have you're gonna have a, a tin at the end, so people can pop some money in. No pressure. You've all paid for your ticket, but if you do have anything extra, please give it to this very wonderful charity. And where can people give it home online? Okay, you can go to mamasforrefugee.org.au. We have a Facebook page. We have thirty thousand followers. We have active groups. Just email us and just... Right. That is such a wonderful charity. I, I have a house guest at the moment who's a Syrian refugee and he is the light of my life. He's just so warm and wonderful and just delightful all of the time. And his stories are incredible and they make me check my privilege every day. We need your help. We really do. We support in Sydney 23 families and 12 um, individuals. And we are like really struggling right now. We want your voice. We want your talents. We want you to not to be afraid and speak up uh, about what's happening to them. Mums for Refugees, please look them up online. Please give them money. If you've got anything tonight, please be generous, as generous as you can. Again, no pressure. It's just been an amazing, amazing time here at Giant Dwarf. Can I please have a big round of applause for everybody who works here at the theatre? <laughs> Also, um, Jeff Ring from Australian Comedy Management has produced all of the live shows and he's been really amazing. Please give him a round of applause. And also, uh, your good Guilty Feminist selves for coming, for listening, for supporting, for being a tribe, for being an army. We want to come back to Sydney again uh, next year. Please, please keep telling people about the podcast. Please keep listening. Please keep tweeting. We really love you. Feel free to come up and say hi at the end. And can I have a huge, huge, huge round of applause for the wonderful Elaine. <laughs> Susie Yousef. My amazing co-pilot for five shows, Cal Wilson. <laughs> Massive round of applause for Deborah Francis White. start with the serious drinking because I don't have a show tomorrow for the first time in ever. <laughs> okay, we want you to follow the Guilty Feminist on Twitter at GuiltFemPod. You can check out our Instagram, instagram.com slash theguiltyfeminist. You can like our Facebook page, you can sign up to our mailing list to get notified as soon as each new episode is released. Please go to iTunes and rate it out of five. The 
five. If, five if stars. You, Give if it five must, stars. Six if you can squeeze them in. Uh, and it helps other people find the podcast. You have been listening to The Guilty Feminists with... <laughs> show in Brisbane. We did a very big show in Melbourne at the Walker um, Centre. At Wheeler Centre. Oh, the Wheeler. Oh, shit. They flew me out. Okay, we'll go again. I did a, I did a very big show in Melbourne at the Wheeler Centre. Ooh, the Wheeler this. Centre. <laughs> I've, I've got a tattoo of the Wheeler Centre on my wrist, obviously. <laughs> <laughs>